content is relevant to some degree. I spend a lot of time, for example, analyzing literature on violent video games and aggression among boys. And the link between violent video games and aggression is pretty damn um, minimal. Mm -hmm. What appears to be the case is that more aggressive boys like more aggressive video games. And yeah. the, there's not much of a causal loop there. So, and the reason I'm bringing that up is uh, to indicate that content of what's being delivered on the cell phone might not be the primary problem. Mm -hmm. That might even be true for pornography. What is certainly a problem is the fact of the substitution of the screen for such things as direct rough and tumble yes. physical play or even abstracted pretend play. You know, a lot of this identity confusion that I see among adolescents in, let's say, high, junior high, high school and university looks to me like late manifestation of pretend play that should have occurred at about the age of three. I'm particularly concerned, like as you said, about, uh, about video games. <clears throat> Not so much because, as you said, of the content, but because of how they outcompete some of these other more traditional nourishments. This is uh, kind of one of my, the fundamental areas of my thought is this idea that one of the most effective ways that we can kind of win in the, in the capitalist system is to deliver something that is hyper-stimulating that's very cheap, right? So hyper-stimulating products. They, a friend of mine uh, who's a neurobiologist who studies um, obesity, he, he said to me that what the food industry has effectively done is they've divorced flavor from nutrition. And, right. and when I thought about that, like I immediately had this chain of, of thinking, which was if, if, if junk food is, is flavor divorced from nutrition, then uh, pornography is sexuality divorced from the context of relationships. Yeah, uh, right. Video games are thrill divorced from physicality. And so you take these boys who have yep. this inherent aggression and you let them play Fortnite and they can play all day without any self-regulation from having to, you know, the physical demands of actual rough and tumble play. They can practice shooting and running and jumping and all the things that, you know, I did as a kid um, actually physically. And that's probably not bad necessarily. It's not that bad necessarily on its own. The problem is that it's yep. so easily outcompetes the actual the actual thing that we need, which is the real physical play. Yeah, well, I saw that just recently this week. I was out with some young people, um, relatives of mine, and I hadn't met them for years. And we were in a social situation for about 45 minutes, uh, sitting around a couch and some, some living room chairs around a fireplace after dinner. And one of them was 13 and the other was 21. And they, just sat, they were just on their cell phones the entire time. The whole yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, well, I felt I felt very bad for the kids because I thought, well, <laughs> first of all, I thought it's like, what the hell are you doing? There's five of us around mm -hmm. the fireplace, and you're on your phones, completely engrossed in them. And I don't know what you're doing on your phone, but whatever you're doing, you're not being here now with actual people. Yeah, absolutely. And I think their whole lives are like that, you know. And part of the reason kids are so confused about their identity is because their identity is never played out in the actual world. They're in these virtual delusions. You know, because what you're describing is actually a kind of delusion, right? It's yeah. an artificial world that isn't properly mapped onto the real world. Mm -hmm. So delusional landscapes of, of entertainment, and that certainly is the case for pornography. Yeah. So, yeah, so we, so the, I mean, this kind of gets to the center of, of my message, you know, like, I think that in order to address the meaning crisis, we actually have to kind of invite people back into their body and that there are mm -hmm. fundamental reconnections that we have to make with the world. We have to renew that relationship with the world. So um, we've been talking a lot about the, 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 the rough and tumble play. And I think of that as one of like four fundamental, or so let's say five fundamental connections we have with the world. And those are kind of the internal connections within the self, the, the body uh, to itself, the body, mind, spirit, emotional aspects. So I think of it as like the somatic and structural layer. And then there's the body to the environment, how we move through the world. And that's parkour um, or gymnastics or track and field. But parkour, I think, is the most kind of profound expression of it. The, it's the closest to the sort of exploratory locomotor play that you find in every culture, 
and in um, um, and really in all other animals almost. Um, and then you have the object manipulation. Human beings, of course, are tool using animals. So right away, kids want to play with sticks and balls and ropes and manipulate them and put them in their mouths when they're little and figure them out. And then there's other people, which is the rough and tumble uh, aspect that we've talked about. And then the last is I think all of those things put us in relationship to something transcendent. When we go out and we do parkour in nature and we work with people, there's, a, there's an emergent spirit that you can experience. There's a sense of the broader things that you're embedded within. And that in order to cultivate wisdom, we actually have to um, get all the way down into the body, all the way into, you know, like our friend John Verbeek, he would say that those lower three Ps of knowing, the, the uh, participatory, perspectival, and procedural, those have to be played out through embodied practices. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so that's, you know, that's a, the center of it. We, we, are, we are tempted all the time by these hyper-stimulating products that are designed to kind of grab onto those areas of the brainstem that, you know, that evolved to be rewarded and, and direct that behavior into something that isn't what we evolved with. And to recover the wisdom, I think we have to go back to those body practices. So, so can, can let me ask yeah. you some practical yeah. questions because yeah. a lot of people who are listening, they might not even know how to initiate play. You know, like people have yeah. asked me to, uh, to write a book on parenting, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the problems I have with that is, well, I don't have little kids anymore. And so yeah. I kind of forget what I know. <laughs> you know, yeah, it was sure. never exactly explicit. Now, I was very fortunate when I was a kid because both my mother and my father paid a lot of attention to me. Mm-hmm. And my dad, in particular, is markedly good with little kids. Oh, wonderful. And I think that was because he had a really, really good relationship with his grandfather and had mm-hmm. a lot of attention paid to him. And so that was just an embodied practice, let's say, in our household. And so I know exactly what to do with little kids. You know, I'm not the least bit afraid of them. I know exactly how to play with them, even if they're timid. I know how to poke them and, you know, jolly them into a bit of a reaction and to entice them out of shyness. But I don't exactly know how to tell people how to do that. 